Hey now, welcome to the dirty side of the track, America's leading Formula One podcast. I'm Brian, that's Rob. A week ago, we had the Australian Grand Prix, and in a week's time, we have the Japanese Grand Prix, and in between, we're going to solve all your silly season problems, but that'll be coming up soon. Rob, how are you, man? Yeah, yeah, I'm really good, thanks. I'm still kind of, you know, on the post-Ferrari one too high, just, uh, <laughs> you know, letting it all sink in, loving it, and then every other day you go in, should they really be letting signs go? Right. Oh, yeah. I've got. So, I got. A, I have a stat on that. We'll get to that in a second. And we'll actually, get to in, that. interestingly, my buddy uh, from high school, who I don't talk to a ton, his daughter is getting into F one, and I recommended they watch Drive to Survive. And we were trading notes about it this week, and I realized my Lewis. I'm a Lewis fan of, of many drivers. I'm a Charles fan of many drivers. So am I a Ferrari fan next year? Because when yeah, they come together... Yeah, you are big time. You've got, you've got be, both, both seats. You've, uh, I mean, I have other drivers I like, seat. but I'm now I am a basically, I'm becoming a Tifosi, aren't I? I You're joining this. me. You're joining. This is gonna, we'll have to basically oh. uh, rebrand next year and just oh. be like a Ferrari podcast. No, but, uh... I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know if I'm ready for that disappointment. <laughs> Anywho, so yes, like you said, we've, we've got the news and social as usual. Brian, oh my, oh wow. When Brian travels and he's like uh, maybe, uh, or when he uh, has time by himself, he he really plums the depth of the internet. And we have a huge video vault this week. I think we got 12, which might be a record. Um, <laughs> then like Brian teased, we are going to solve all of Silly Season. We are basically going to not just predict, we're going to guarantee what next year's driver lineup <laughs> is going to look like. Except we're going to do it in a fashion which makes sure that guarantee won't come true. <laughs> I mean, It'd be interesting to see how many we get right on our stupid little game that we've got. Because, yes, there's no race this week, so we really had to pull some sort of contact <laughs> out of thin air. Uh, and it was very thin, the air that we found, that we pulled this from. Uh, and then yes. we'll finish off with a Suzuka preview because we do go racing again next week. So, yeah, let's dive into what we found. It was a quiet-ish week, and then all of a sudden stuff started trickling through. So, Aston Martin are not going to appeal the Alonso penalty. And I think it's fair to say the whole, the whole thing around that incident split. Every, I mean, a, it split me and you to some degree. We had a sort of heated debate over whether Alonso was really in a blind corner. Did he break? Did he slow down too much? Was George flying in too fast anyway? Anyway, whole internet seemed to have that uh, discussion about whether or not um, Alonso had really done anything that wrong. And I think you'd said last week, did they really give the penalty for the outcome rather than the move yeah. itself? Um, but the thing that maybe we did a debate a little bit that really lit up was the whole VSC versus red flagging it. My gosh, there were some heated debates about that. Yeah, and then, I mean, part of it was not long after the race, we heard, you know, George's team radio. And we talked about that a little bit last week, that, you know, red flag, red flag, red flag. I'm in the middle of the track upside down, red flag, red flag. And I, I even said it reminded me recently of Stroll when he had a blowout, when his tire let go, and he was sort of in the middle, middle-ish in Baku on that bat, really long high speed back straight, which is for that one is a blind corner. You come around it and there's strolls sitting there in the middle of the road. So yeah, I, I totally get the debate there. Like I, you know, from a safety perspective, people want to assume the red flags best, but also a VSC will immediately lower people's speeds to a, sort of a safer perspective. And like I said, it was Stroll who came up first on the accident before other people had even had a second to, to really know what was happening. And his engineer did a bang on job of saying, yeah. you've got a car in the middle of the road, watch out, watch out, watch out. And then after that, people had time to figure it out. So I agree with you. Both of those are big heated debates. I'm still not sure which is right on either one. No, so, same here, same here. Um, the one thing that I leave it on was uh, Damon Hill um, came out and said he thought Alonso had done nothing wrong. And if we start going down the rabbit hole of analyzing everybody's previous corner as to how they've taken another corner, is a defensive driver ever going to be able to exist again? Right. Because the moment you're hanging on for a position, you're going to do things differently. So the whole kind of nuts of this uh, um, penalty to say, well, look, he took this corner this way all the previous laps, and this time he did it differently, therefore it's wrong. Hmm. I think I'm with Damon on that one. Though. Yeah, I, don't I am too. Give it. But again, we spoke about this last week. I'm much more comfortable accelerating slowly out of corners when no one's in any peril and it's just you're stuck there. But acceler breaking early into corners, and I don't think it was a brake test. I'm not saying that. But if it were or something to that degree, I do see there being a bigger safety concern. And so if you really brake tested somebody and they had oh, yeah, to bail out, yeah. and I'm not saying that's what, what like Fernando did. Stafford just, and Lewis, wasn't yeah. it? When, uh, yeah, exactly, in, <laughs> in uh, Saudi Arabia. I'm not for the yeah. DRS. I'm not saying that's what this was. So please don't start to sending me notes, Zap. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. I'm not saying he did that. But that's where I think the line should be drawn, in my opinion, if you see people do something like that. 
Yeah, agree. Right, um, me and Brian don't have the uh, rumour mill chopper this week because Eddie Jordan has uh, stolen <laughs> it and has gone flying above the rumour mill. Um, he basically says that um, he believes that if Red Bull opt against uh, signing Carlos Sainz for 2025, then he believes Sainz will head to Aston Martin as part of an all-Spanish lineup. And he's basically saying that's that's fact. That's going to happen. Sainz is either going to Red Bull unless they opt out. If not, definitely going to Aston Martin. I don't know if Eddie's got any uh, inside information going on there, but uh... does Lawrence Stroll still own the team? <laughs> well, does his son still long... occupy one of the seats? Yeah, I, yeah, I know. But uh, anyway, you found another one that's been uh, yeah, and we've hit a lot of these around the rumor mill. Yeah, we've hit a lot of these over the last couple of weeks. We've talked a lot about Nui and where Adrian will be going this time. It's one that's kind of picked up a little speed, so much so, so that motorsport.uol.com.br. I don't know what. Is it Brazil? I don't know. I should know. Brazil. Let's say Brazil. Yeah, let's just go for it. Sure. Um, Vettel confirms conversations with Toto Wolf for the Hamilton vacancy. Oh, boy. Really? I mean, like, I love Seb, but he's been out a little bit now. And I could see him saying, you know what? I'd love to come back and drive for Mercedes as a German for, you know, that team. And that would be fun. And I respect Toto, I'm sure. And you know, it's a good car on the on the way up, we would think. And, uh, you know, I could see him saying all that. But I have a question for you, Rob. There was another person who drove for Mercedes more recently winning a championship than Seb did. His name was Nico Rosberg. Well, like, why isn't Nico knocking to? Like, should we just get everybody who retired recently who's not real old and link them to the seat at this point? Like, I was thinking about this. Nico Rosberg makes more sense than Seb. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, well, hmm. Maybe. Nico Rosberg didn't have unfinished business, right? He won the title and just basically dropped Mike and walked away, didn't he? That was it. I, well, I'm... Seb won four he... of them. I mean, did he? No, he but what won... I mean is yeah. that, that. So he went. It wasn't like age related. I mean, he oh, had yeah, many yeah. years left on the clock if Correct. he wanted to. He just decided, I'm done. I've done what I needed to do. I'm out of here. Vettel was a consistent winner. Um, maybe he left the sport in a car that wasn't the greatest, but he wasn't too old when, when Seb stepped away. He wasn't that old, was he? Because, I mean, look, let's face it, Alonso's older than everybody uh, <laughs> on the grid. So, I don't know, I could see Seb. It, it depends. Maybe once a racing driver, always a racing driver, maybe being away from it for a while, there's that itch that he just can't scratch, and uh, he would think about it. But I'm going to call complete BS on this one. <laughs> I do not see it happening. Agreed, agreed. And yet, I was wrong, by the way. Nico's 38, Seb's 36. I was sure it was the other way around. So Ooh. I messed you that get one up. fast fingers on the internet there. I know. That. I know. The next story is a curious one for a couple reasons. So Max is set to lose his chief mechanic, an 18 year Red Bull veteran, Lee Stevenson, who um, apparently left on March 28th. We're recording this on Saturday, the 30th. So he's been out for a couple of days. Not necessarily known where he's going, other than it's a team at the other end of the pit lane. I did see Engine Mode 11 Dan have a lot of news on this one where he, I couldn't, I didn't read the whole thing where he kind of debunked a little bit of the importance of this, I think. But, you know, it's, I don't know, curious where when one or two of these start happening from a top team, and if one or two more happen, like what's the tipping point where, you know, maybe Max says, all right, maybe I do look somewhere else. Eh, I, I've got to I don't say, think this is it, but I think there's more I don't think this is it. I yeah. really think it's if Adrian knew he leaves, and when he leaves, he hasn't left behind a set of uh, drawings for the next four years' worth of cars. Uh, you know, that's... The um... RB21, the RB22. <laughs> exactly. Uh, talking about teams at the other end of the pit stop, Sauber. Oh, boy. oh, oh dear. No. This, I find this a bit weird, because yes. it's all about the pit stop thing, right? Now, normally, most teams, when they have kind of blunders like this and a couple of mistakes that happen back to back, somebody has put not from the very necessary the team principal, but usually somebody quite senior is peddled out in front of the media. They're asked, what's the problem? When are you going to fix it? And we hear a little inside story as to, you know, what the issue is. It's like a routine mystery. Like, we're not allowed to know what it really is. It's like uh, they were asking uh, Zevi Pujola. Hmm. You're going for that? Uh, racing director. <laughs> Close enough, I guess. Close enough. Um, he said, from the first race, we found some issues with pit stops with the cross thread. It's something that we don't find when we do free practice or even during the winter. Not quite sure why the winter is that relevant now. Uh, but then every time we go into a race situation, it becomes critical. We took some containment this week. Sounds like a Ghostbuster trap. I'm not quite sure what <laughs> containment is. Um, and we did some small modifications. It's not robust enough, and we had a pit stop issue. As long as we have this issue, it becomes very difficult for us. It's not the problem with the crew. It's the hardware. We just need to make sure we've got a solution, and the parts we'll try to fix in Suzuka. However, they then acknowledge that the final solution will take a bit longer. 
either you know what the problem is and it should be really, really simple to fix. I mean, surely it's just a real gun with a nut in and just, just go and buy the same one from Home Depot that they're using on the next par up. I mean... Or, I don't know, get last year's? You had one that worked last year. I... When, when Alfa Romeo, were they in charge of the branding, in charge of the wheel nuts, and when they left, they took them with them, and now you don't have a prototype anymore? I don't understand what happened year to year. I also don't understand how every single car in the grid in the history of F1 who've been using these similar type wheel nuts have never had a problem like this. Mercedes is machined one, if you're in Valtteri in Monaco, where he was stuck, and they like ground it off where they couldn't get it off. But other than that, it's pretty rare to see this problem. This has happened three races in a row where they got pieces of the wheel nuts rolling around around bouncing around they're changing them out it, he says the crew are doing everything correctly i agree i don't think the crew are screwing this up at all somebody designed this wrong i don't understand why it's so hard to get a wheel nut designed correctly it's not like the transmission the gearbox it's not like you got a gearbox probably i take all apart oh by the way the the battery and the way the hybrid works not that's all the brakes this is a wheel nut it doesn't move other than when the gun touches it why is this okay. so hard so here's a question for you. Maybe we've got to ask Pitlane Paul this because obviously he used to do this very same job of changing wheels in the pit lane. Well, they say when they use this hardware, this same hardware in free practice or in testing, they've never seen the issue. It only raises its head in the race. Is there a separate button on the thing that you like? We when we put the wheels on in testing, we press this button, which is slow. <laughs> it works fine, but as soon as we use the race button, it. it cross threads i i don't understand how if he's not blaming the team and he's saying it's just the hardware how does a wheel nut know whether it's free practice or right. race I, 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 no. is it the gun anyway. or is it the nut it can't be anything other than those one of those two things fix both i don't understand it's getting bad and i actually found a stat on this in 2024 through three races three one two three three sauber has spent 158.42 seconds 158.42 seconds doing 11 pit stops. This is more time than the following drivers for the entirety of a 22 race season in 23. Carlos Sainz, Lance Stroll, Max Verstappen, Charles Leclerc, Lewis Hamilton, Pierre Gasly, Yuki Tsunoda, Esteban Ocon, and Fernando Alonso. And just to show you the difference, I recognize it's three drivers, so it's six races worth of stops, right? Both drivers are cumulative, Valtteri and Joe. Six races, 158.42 seconds. <laughs> Carlos signs in 22 races, 98.14. <laughs> what, <laughs> what is happening? What is happening? I don't understand what is happening here. Uh, I like. Uh, I was pretty hot about this after the first race, and then we're like, oh, it's not their fault. There's something wrong in the second race. Well, they should be figuring it out by now. And then it still goes on in the third race. I don't. Why race if you're going to have to not be competitive whatsoever because you can't do a pit stop? I don't I don't know. It's like so bizarre to me. It's really very frustrating. Um last well last kind of little story I think before we go into some you've gone fantastic which is amazing I'm loving it. Um last kind of story was that Liberty Media set to buy uh, MotoGP as well to add to F1 and this just got a little kind of uh, childish part of me giggling which was that back way back when when there was a lot of american investment coming into english football um the running joke was oh what they're going to do they're going to want to put loads of gimmicks in it we're going to have multi-ball and all this kind of stuff going on in the game and i was thinking yeah so here we go liberty going to buy uh, moto gp and we're going to have uh you ever play any of those video games where you got the multi-series racing at the same time so <laughs> yes <laughs> f1 and bikes or uh, yeah that's what liberty going to do in vegas next year um yeah, that's just me, I think, just being stupid and childish. But yeah, so they're going to buy it. But they're going to buy it, but apparently they're going to be allowed to do it. Whereas apparently, and I didn't take the notes for this, there was a previous owner that owned both F1 and MotoGP rights, and they were forced uh, to sell it off to, whether it's Monopoly or whatever, but they were forced to break it apart. So I'm not quite sure if that rule was back then, why Liberty are allowed to do it. But Weird. there we go. They will soon own almost all types of racing, four wheels and two wheels. Well, right. So Speaking I'll hand over of, to you now yeah. for Statsville. Well, you know what? Because it is stats, let's get a little bit of uh, the Nokia song since it's not as timely. Sap Stats cleaning up the Aussie GP and other things edition. There's no race this week. All right. So the power rankings came out after the Australian Grand Prix. And not surprisingly, um, you know, voted on by five or so members of the media. Uh, media outlets and you get the a ranking and number one was carlos who drove a great race had a great weekend showed incredible toughness 
uh, was given a perfect 10. You don't often see the perfect 10. It's not necessarily for the first ranked person, but he got a 10. Okay, Lando was second with an 8.8. All right, he had a good race. Um, yeah, I was second. I was a little surprised. Yuki was oh, third I, with an 8. I haven't 8. looked at this graphic, and I'm just scrolling down. I'm waiting you to get there, but go on, keep going. I got a lot of them here. Yuki was third with an 8.2. I mean, I mean he yeah. did finish in the points, and he was ahead of the Haas team. Speaking of Haas, Nico was tied for third with an 8.2. And at this point, I'm like, huh, this is curious. I mean, like, we've gone to the bottom of the points. Oscar... 8.0 in fifth. Okay, he was fourth, right right behind uh, Lando, and they team-swapped him. Charles, who finished second for the 1-2 Rob talked about, a 7.8. I don't know what Charles did so wrong to end up as a 7.8. And then K-Mag, we close out the low points finisher, 7.6. How did Max get it? Max got a 7.2. He rode four laps with a brake that was stuck on. How did you get any score for that? Did they just score... Is it just for the race, or does quality creep into this? I don't this? know. I don't know. And How then, on earth is Max Verstappen in the top 10 power rankings? Like, even when he DNFs, you can't keep the man down. Okay, you can't. He's that good. He was better than Albon and Esteban, apparently. But anyway, I thought that was curious. And then a couple other things we did see um, that we had uh, the 1-2 of Ferrari, as Rob already referenced. At Melbourne, we've had a handful of 1-2 finishes for a team over the years. Starting in 1996 with the Williams Renault team, Damon Hill, and none other than friend of the pod. This is Jacques Villeneuve, and you're listening to the dirty side of the track. That was uh, Jack's rookie year in F1, if I'm remembering correctly. Followed in 1998, McLaren Mercedes had Hakkinen and Coulthard, and then we had Ferrari, two of them in 2000 and 2004, Schumacher and Rubens. And then we go to the beautiful Braun year of 2009. If you haven't listened to our Braun GP episode, you should go check it out. It is amazing. It's on our website, www.dirtysideofthetrack.com. Check special episodes. But Jensen and Rubens uh, won two in Australia. And then there are three Mercedes. And we have Hamilton and Rosberg, Rosberg and Hamilton. And in 2019, finishing first... We had another friend of the pod. This is Valtteri Bottas, and you're listening to the dirty side of the track. And Lewis Hamilton finished behind him. So I just wanted to highlight those amazing drivers. Two of whom have been on our pod. Um, one other stat, and I brought this up last week kind of off the cuff, um, and I did have it right. The times when Carlos has won, George has never finished. Um, those three times, and so it was kind of funny. However, since Miami of last year to Australia now, inclusive... A bunch of drivers have finished P2 behind Max, and we've talked a lot about some of them. Checo's had five P2s, Lando had five P2s, Charles had three, Fernando's had three, Lewis has had two, and Oscar's had one. Do you know who's never finished P2 behind Max when Max finishes? Carlos. <laughs> Yet he's won all of the races other than a Red Bull driver in that time. <laughs> Zah. I love but, the fact you find these stats. It's just, uh, I have visions of you kind of like, like in your basement, dimly lit room. Yes. Just maybe yes. not even lit, just lit yeah, by no. the laptop that you're uh, yep. researching. Correct. And, yeah. Multiple yeah. laptops. I got one hand typing on one, one hand typing on the other, and there's like some weird music going. During their time as teammates, so, and Rob, I would like your, your thoughts on this. During their time as teammates at Ferrari, Carlos and Charles have won the same number of races now, three. Charles has one more podium than Carlos, 19 to 18, in the Grand Prix where they've both entered. And Carlos was kicked to the curb in favor of Lewis. And we've always known Charles has been sort of the main driver there, and they had him longer, and he's been, you know, sort of the, the future, if you will. I'd still, it's one of those things where, like, it feels like Carlos is getting done dirty, and he just keeps proving it over and over again. He raced twice this year, and what does he finish second and first and missed one for an appendix? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, he, now I, I know the difference in poles. Sorry, one last thing. Huge difference in poles. Charles is a great Saturday driver, great pole position finisher, but that also then comes with a horrendous pole to win conversion ratio for him. Um, Carlos doesn't have that many pole positions. He has a handful. But so sorry to you. Like, what are your thoughts? Because it's going to happen all year as we're going to talk about this. Yeah, I mean, it'd just be interesting to see. Ferrari must be kind of desperate for. A, obviously the team to do well and a, and a, and a competitive science to spur Charles on and they want to see a, a reaction from him. But they must be desperate for Charles to finish with more points than science come the end of the season. Have That's to going to be a real awkward conversation. You <laughs> have to be, you're totally Science, right. especially if, if it's marginal, maybe it's not so much. But if it's like magnitudes of, let's say it's at least a race winner more, you know, 25 points or more clear of uh, Charles, then that's going to have to be a 
I, I don't know. I, it, they can't really go back on it, I guess, because they're no. like, they've signed contracts with Lewis. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like, it'll just be a, I, I, like I say, as a Ferrari fan, I just like to see that it will spur them both on. And I would love to see um, Science get a good seat next year as well. So, I mean, it would be hard if you finish second in the championship and it's, Smooth operator. and then you scroll down and you scroll down and you scroll down and like Charles six, Chuck Leclerc. that would be bad. But I, I got faith in my boy, Charles. He'll come around. By the way, um, just before you finish, move on to the yeah. next of this. I love the fact that last week in the hotel room, you were no absolutely sounds. starved of your sounds. Yeah. We are about 20 minutes into recording and we've nearly heard all of your sounds. It's brilliant. Oh, You're just wait like... for the game. Wait for the game. I got sounds out the wazoo. It's like, uh, you know, when you get caught up from missing work and all those emails are in your inbox. That's me. The sounds are a plenty. Um, okay. So I don't like a lot of the stats where they talk about all time points. Because points changed in 2009, and we redid the way points were given out, and we've changed them over the years. Fastest lap, not fastest lap. How many points paying positions are there? And we've added sprints. It's I don't really like that as a average scoring amount. However, there's a record that Lando set last week that I don't think is getting the attention, and I don't know if it's deserved, but it's just not really being talked about. Lando Norris now holds the all-time record for most podiums in F1 without a victory. He has 14 podiums, no victories. He was first. Nick Heidfeld, famously uh, for never winning, has 13 podiums and is now second. And then you go on down the list a bit. And I unfortunately feel like this is actually a, a record that kind of translates through the generations. If your car's good enough to get on the podium, you, you got to be there for one of those shots when it's a chance to win. And Lando had three or four shots, not recently, but like the Russia rain situation and 21 yeah, yeah. and other things he had chances to win and i know he's up against the rb19 now or leaving the tail end of lewis i i get it like i know he's facing against dominant cars but he's still sniffing around there and one of these times it's got to be him not carlos picking up one of these wins yeah and then, then this this is a really really weird record because this is a record that although nick heifeld is long since out of f1 he can reclaim top spot as soon as lando wins <laughs> that's true that's a good point it's, a it's, good... It's, a, it's a bizarre one it's like lando can extend and extend and make this record like he could take it further and further away he gave it he can get 20 without it and then suddenly win and suddenly the the worst is 13 again it's a <laughs> it's a weird stat but yeah there we go and then a quick calendar note um we are on an every other week cadence in terms of races right we started off um, kind of doing this where we had a couple and then we had after Saudi Arabia, we went to Australia, two weeks, Australia, two weeks, Japan, two weeks, China, two weeks, Miami, two weeks, uh, Imola and Imola has a new sponsor and the name of Imola's race has gotten even longer because it wasn't long enough before it's now the formula one MSC cruises grand premio del made in Italy e di Emilia Romagna 2024. That's the name of the friggin' race. That hashtag is going to be brutal. It's going to take all hashtag of our characters. Is gonna use, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. use all the characters. It's just being done on purpose to force people to subscribe, to pay for Twitter. So yeah, they it's 138 the, the characters allowance. in the hashtag alone. You get two. Oh, man. Right. Okay. Um, I might have to I might just little, have a little sit down for the next 10 minutes then while, uh, <laughs> while we listen to you go through these. Because I've seen two on this list of 12. So I'm going to be educated like everyone else listening, Brian, if you want to. Open up the video vault. I shall do some ten minutes. We're doing it with our mouths this week. <laughs> All right. So this is a longer video vault. So if you're not interested, just fast forward about five minutes. But I'll keep it to that. Here we go. So there are twelve this week. I'm not kidding. There are four must watches. So I'll at least highlight the must watches. If your time is precious, just hit those. First race recreation, the 2024 Lego Australian Grand Prix from the Moving Bricks. We've highlighted this channel years ago. It's been a while. I love this thing. It was nine minutes. It's really well done. The end, they get into like interviews of Lego guys. You can skip those so you can trim a little bit of time off. But I really enjoy the Moving Bricks race recreations when they come out. And similarly, the Australian GP 2024 highlights uh lollipop man seven minutes i just can't say enough about these and when max was out the way he went out the whole thing was just great like lollipop man nails it week in week out but i just wanted to highlight those two because they always put a smile on my face that wasn't one they're two of the ones about. that i've seen yeah no they're two of the ones that i've seen so uh, oh, i agree, agree. They're, they're, they're both great but now we're going to start getting into some real random stuff. so the, the all right the, yes we are so the lollipop man is one of the must watches look at me i'm the captain now a box of bluffs featuring carlos Sainz and lando norris this is on the f1 channel proper 
It's five minutes long. I love when they get Carlando back together. Like the two of them still have great chemistry. Again, with the Carlos thing, has he ever been a bad teammate? I can't think of one time I've ever had a, heard of a teammate complaining about Carlos. He is somebody sign him for a, a big deal to a top team. And when they got back together, it was top notch. This is the second must watch. And then I got a couple I'll just hit quickly. An F1 driver beach race on the Red Bull channel proper, not their F1 channel. Seven minutes. Red Bull and Toro Rosso on the beach. It's neat. Danny, Rick, Yuki, Checo, and Max doing some stuff on an Australian beach like uh, Baywatch, if you will. Uh, except they're in like windbreakers because it's really cold out apparently. Um, but it was funny to, funny to watch. And then on the Red Bull theme, you look ridiculous. Max Verstappen and Sergio Perez play giant Jenga on from Red Bull F1 on the Kyo Sports channel. I don't know what Kyo Sports is, but they have a channel. And um, it's only three minutes. And I was offended by this video, not because of the content. The content is great. If you like, if you like watching, um, sorry, Checo or Max, go check it out. It's really good. However, do they not think there are people like me who saw the Ray-Ban channel one when they did this with Carlos and Charles? It's exactly the same. Jenga with questions. You pull them out. You answer the question. Keep playing Jenga. I saw that already. Someone else did that. You copy them. Uh, sorry, K.O. K.O. Uh, Team Torque, the episode three Australian Grand Prix on the Williams channel. Williams Racing, 22 minutes. It's basically their podcast, but they film it and put it on YouTube. No Logan. So not only did Alex take his car... They took his chair for the podcast as well. I was really bummed. I, and it was the first time they haven't had Logan on there. I didn't even watch it. I just was like, where's Logan? I turned it on. The, and Alex goes, no Logan today. I'm thinking, yeah, you got his car and his seat in the podcast. Um, and then here we go. So Carlos and Charles, the ultimate F Ferrari teammate challenge. Okay. This is on the F1 Australian Grand Prix channel. I'd never seen this channel before. I subscribed. They had a bumper load of videos. So if you're really starved, they had all these teammate videos, which were great. I'm only going to highlight two. I did go down the rabbit hole pretty far. I'm only bringing two because I knew we had too many videos. It's nearly seven minutes, this one. So, so good. First of all, they're quizzing. They're quizzed about each other. Carlos about Charles and Charles about Carlos. And they're out in like this big stage. There's this huge audience and they're yelling answers at them and they're trying to listen in and get help. It was a lot of fun. I really, I really enjoyed that one. And the second one I'll highlight from the F1 Australian Grand Prix channel. Who said that? F1 team radio quiz with Pierre Gasly and Esteban Ocon. This was also great. So they play team radio messages from all kinds of drivers, from all kinds of eras. And the two of them try to guess who's saying what. And Pierre is terrible at this game. He basically checked out, at one point was just talking to people in the audience. Esteban, on the other hand, was surprisingly good at it. Pierre didn't even know his own. So anyway. Oh my gosh. Uh, and then this one was new to me, Rob. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Lando Norris chicken shop date. Amelia de Moldenberg, six minutes. I've never seen a chicken shop date before, but she does this with all kinds of celebrities. No, okay, you haven't seen no, Amelia no, no, new to de me. Moldenbergs? Okay. But I still found it through my internet sleuthing. I mean, she has a big channel with a lot of views. So don't get me wrong. These are million view videos that usually she cranks out. So a lot of people are watching this. I thought it was pretty funny. Not funny enough to make it a must watch. But if you're a Lando fan or you're interested in Amelia's chicken shop videos, or if I've piqued your curiosity with this, definitely go check it out. Here's another must watch though. Has Oscar Piastri ever peed in the car? The lie detector on the Sky Sports F1 channel. Nearly six minutes. I love these. I love these. I don't know how accurate the lie detector is. I mean, they do them on GQ and all kinds of places for all kinds of things. But they, they gave him some pretty hard questions about him and being competitive with Lando and do you rub it in, you know, your success that he hasn't had in the sprint race and other things. And they asked him about Mark Webber and Mark Webber versus Seb. And like he answers the questions and the lie detector proves he's, I mean, it's at one point he goes, I think I need a new manager. So like, I definitely enjoyed this one. It's a must watch. Uh, and the last couple are both from the Sauber channel. Um, first, rating F1 drivers as surfers featuring Valtteri Bottas and Channel 10 Scott McKinnon. By the way, that was the best I've ever done with Valtteri's last name. Um, I loved it. This was basically them just judging which F1 drivers are or could be surfers. And it was hilarious. Like, again, Valtteri is a, is a prize. He's a, a national treasure. He's an international treasure. Um, he is just amazing. And that's why the last video of The Vault is the last must-watch. Can F1 drivers drift? Valtteri Bottas and Joe Guan Yu learn to drift Sauber eight minutes. This is great. 
I love these things. First of all, I love teammates doing stuff. You heard a bunch up top from Red Bull and RB and all these other ones that I look and Ferrari. And we, you know, I'm always on the lookout for getting teammates together and doing things. Second, I love when they do stuff they've never done before, where they actually have to try something new. And they, if they really try it, it's fun. This is in a car, no less. And watching these two incredibly talented drivers learn to drift, it was gold. It's just so good. Please go watch it. I promise it's one of those four must-watches. Rob, any comments before I close a bumper crop of videos? No, no, you can close that vault up so we can get onto the gate. Oh, I got to catch my breath after that. I was trying to trying to keep it brief. There were so many, but it was a good week. Good week of videos. It, it was, certainly was for you. Um, no, I do appreciate you delving into the depths of the internet for for. I say for everyone, but I'm. I check know the Lando just, one. You, I didn't make it a muscle. You love it. You, you, you would do it if we one. didn't have a podcast. You'd oh, be yeah. watching all these anyway. So hundred um, percent. That's what I'd be <laughs> Anyways, doing. Yeah, I wouldn't be taking notes though. That'd be the only difference. True. Right. Okay. So we all know uh, Brian called it super early. He was calling it as, as far back as last year when he kind of had the foresight to look forward and say, there's a lot of drivers coming out of contract uh, next year. And uh, we had a really poor, silly season last year. This one's going to be crazy. So we were like, well, we haven't got any race to cover this week. What should we do? Okay. We will uh, distribute all the drivers up across all the seats that are up for grabs uh, this season. We make our prediction uh, using highly scientific methods <laughs> as to what all the driver line what all the driver lineups will be next year. Now, of course, we're only going to do this across eight teams, and um, because McLaren and Ferrari are all set, uh, their driver lineups going nowhere. We know it's Ferrari is going to be uh, Lewis and Charles, and McLaren are keeping Oscar and Lando. So that's all set. And then on Mercedes, we'll only we only have one seat to assign because George is all set. Everything else is up for grabs. So our highly scientific manner is we have two. Well, I say hats; they're bags. I have two bags. Uh, one bag <laughs> has the eight dry, uh, team names in them. And the other bag has all the drivers that are out of contract, plus a handful of uh, young and upcoming F2 stars or people sitting on the sidelines that are trying to get into F1. We will draw uh, a team, and then we will draw four drivers at random. And me and Brian will decide which one of those, which two of those four drivers are going to take the seats at the car that we've picked. And that's it. That's our driver line in, locked up for that team, onto the next one, and so on and so forth, until we will have completed our Dirty Side 2025 driver lineup. So, and, and you may say, why wouldn't we just take this, you know, look at it all in totality and assign drivers to each team as it makes sense? Well, that makes too much sense. And the silly season isn't the silly season for no reason. And obviously, as Rob said, we saw these contracts coming up and we, we kind of predicted this upcoming silly season as well as one year left in the old regs, which is a great chance to try out a new driver for the new regs. So instead of that, we're doing the best we can to use our crystal ball and this game of where will the dr dirty side drivers draft here i actually have music for this special music with a horn in it and i know there's oh no gosh. horn in an f1 car so everyone back off on that one but here we go <laughs> That is from oh, Bump, Bumper Stumpers, which is right. a real TV right. show in Canada in the 80s that I watched as a youth when my parents had parked me in front of the TV. Right? It wasn't I from Canada. I need to ask you, Brian. Yeah. Brian, so you, how many times do you listen to that music to be able to, because obviously no one will have to see what you just did, but you just air horned in time with every single <laughs> that came. <laughs> hey, man, when your parents' idea of a babysitter was the TV, um that's how i grew up man and so like yeah bumper stumpers was my favorite game show the host had a heavy canadian accent welcome to bumper stumpers and uh anyway we won't go down that rabbit hole right, so rob let's get on with this. shall i play some music while you draw the first team and the first set of drivers yes i'm gonna draw the first team now if you want to set have i got bed music have i to draw to uh yes you ready three here comes the first yeah, one okay Ooh. wow very okay and our first Part of car. Our first team is out of the hat, and it is Williams. Oh boy! Okay. All right. So we will be picking our Two. Williams lineup first. And you need some more music for the drivers. You're good. Well, I mean, you're the music man, so I'm going to start drawing yeah. four drivers out now. Yeah, you just start drawing, and you can play music if you want. Here we go. Yeah. Okay, I have one piece of paper, two pieces of paper. Ooh. Uh, three and four. Right. Okay. So we have to assign two of these to Williams for 2025. We will be picking two of Oliver Behrman. Oh. Uh, Alonso. Oh. 
Perez. Oh. Or Valtteri Bottas. No way. This is going to be so hard. Now, when they don't get chosen, they go back in the hat, right? So They, can... they go back in the hat. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to run out of drivers. Yeah. We won't have enough to assign across. So driving for Williams in 2025. You get to pick the first one of those four. I'll pick the second one. And we can debate as we do this. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna I try to be sensible with our silly version of silly season. I I would pick Bearman because he needs to cut his teeth. I think we I don't throw him into a top tier team straight away. He needs to earn his stripes at Williams. So I'm gonna put Mr. Bearman uh, in as one driver slot. I I would say. Well, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I think it's you know it's a great call for the long term. I think it's probably a more cost effective long term future type driver. Williams has been known for doing that over the years. Actually, and one of my favorite Williams drivers is going to take the other seat. This is Valtteri Bottas, and you're Ooh. listening to the dirty side of the So track. if anyone doesn't know this, Valtteri uh, drove for Williams. And so... Um, Did in that martini livery, wasn't it? it was yes, epic. 2014 yeah. onward there. That was such a beautiful car, and he's such an amazing driver. Um, okay. I think they would be so lucky to have Valtteri come back to Williams and kind of teach Ollie a bunch of what he needs to know and take them into the new regs as their lead driver. Um, nice. I think that would be, I think Valtteri has the um, personality to take that team forward as opposed to maybe Alonso a little too fiery for a team that's still not quite yeah, and where I think, to be. I, I think Alonso is going to be wanting to have a great car underneath him before exactly. he cashes out of F1, so I don't see him wanting yeah. to go to Williams. Okay, so there we go. Right, you, do you have more music for the second team? Oh, do I ever. So let's go for the next one. Isn't this the same as the first one? Nope. Right, okay. Some of these are going to get into the 70s next, and they're going to all sound similar, but they're all different. We, we, we're, we're going from the lower half of the grid first. Uh, next out is Toro Rosso, or the big long name that I can't be bothered to say. Uh, actually, this one. You mean this team? Uh, Alfa Tori or V-Carb or uh, their, their name of the week. Uh, <laughs> looks like they're you know certainly competitive. Uh, Toro okay. Rosso. All right. Okay. We've got, oh my gosh, we've got to try and get these four names out of the hat. This, this, I shouldn't have used a bag that was so tight at the bottom. I'm having to dig deep here. Right. Okay. So I have our four drivers. Who is going to Toro Rosso out of Ooh, Duhan? Mick? Duhan? Okay. Yeah. So we've got, uh, we got an outsider already potentially looking for yeah. him. Same as Behrman as well. Oh, Carlos Sainz. Uh oh. Uh, Grugovic. Or. Logan Sargent. Ooh, oh, okay. wow. This is a tough yeah. one. I get to go first on this one. You get to go first. Who are you going to sign first into I mean... VB Carb Cash App uh, hashtag car with no name? <laughs> you know, I uh, I don't... I should say this up front. We're doing this as best we can for the teams and the team composition and the drivers. We're not doing this necessarily for the drivers, right? So Valtteri probably wouldn't go back to Williams. Like, just let's be honest, right? We kind of know that from the last choice. And the same way that my man, the smooth operator, won't purposely go back to Toro Rosso, even though he started his career there. Um, but he is going to happen, Carlos. Stop it, Stop it, oh, Wendy. you're putting signs into Toro signs Rosso. Is going, oh, yeah, he's, of those four, why wouldn't I? I mean, Toro, okay. if he could, he could single-handedly drag Toro Rosso back into the conversation being, you know, relevant, maybe not at the front of the grid, but right afterwards. Now, again, I'm, I'm taking it from the team's perspective. No, I'm I know. And so, and therefore, I'm going to be brutally honest and say I don't know enough about Duhan and Drugovic, and I have got a soft spot for the boy Logan. So I'm going to see if he can get mentored by Carlos. I think Toro Rosso with Signs and Sergeant. Oh, look at that! That I like a little bit of alliteration as yeah. well. So, <laughs> Signs and Sergeant, Toro Signs Rosso, and Sergeant. Okay. Uh, Logan right. probably Moving pretty on. happy to uh to have a seat on the grid. All right. Moving on. T Rob will select the next team. Okay, here we are. Out of the hat. We have Dun dun dun. Oh, we are going from the bottom up. Alpine. Ha ha ha. Je ne peux pas comprendre. Yeah, I know. So, right, okay, four drivers. Who are we going to get this time out of the hat? We are going to get Perez. Perez wants to come back. He's having a comeback. Uh, we are going to have Hockenberg. Nico. We are going to have Haymag. Oh, can we take the, can we take the hash the partnership Hass across boys. the team? And we are going to have Poucher. Theo Porcher. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So it's me first to assign somebody into Alpine, right? 
It is. Oh, well, I. Ooh. Mm, this is bad now because part of me wants to say, right, Checo. I'm going to give Checo a crack at an, a, a, another team, but he's just disappointing me so much not even being able to get a rocket ship around the track that I think if I'm looking at someone to try to drag Alpine out of the mire, I'm going to have to go for somebody who's dragging that Hass around and I'm going to put Oppenberg into the first seat at, at so Alpine. Th this is where you're going? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I didn't see that coming. Well, it's, it, you leave me an obvious, an easy one. Teo Porcher. Teo Porcher is young. He's 20 years old. He's achieved a lot in the lower levels. And dare I say, he's French. And the mm. Alpine team loves that. So um, they're going to end up with losing two Frenchies and they'll put one back in, one for the future. Uh, Teo Porcher. Okay, All right. Let me right. find the next song. Okay. Rob's going to get next our next song for the team. next team. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Okay, um, I was wrong at the beginning, wasn't I? Because I said um, only Mercedes have got one seat up for grabs because Red Bull have got only one seat up for grabs as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, because it's not, uh, Max's isn't up at the end of right, the day. Right, so right. we have Red Bull right, we have Red Bull right yeah. here. Still yeah, eight teams, right. but we have Red Bull. So draw so two drivers only. we draw two only, this so, time. Yeah. Two drivers only to go alongside Max. So who is going to be Max's partner from... <laughs> Ooh, okay. We have first one out the hat, Alonso. <gasps> oh, the stars might oh, be aligned. The stars might be aligning here. Oh, who's got it? Who's? I think we both have to agree on this one, being it's only one slot. So, is it going to be old father time, Fernando Alonso, star of the future, Liam Lawson? <gasps> who is? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes oh my gosh. The, the randomness of life gives you perfection. I mean, this is this is almost the real the real conundrum. It is. That, oh. Fernando wants to go there. They obviously don't want to keep Checo. I don't think at this point. Fernando would like to go there, but Liam Lawson's in their driver academy, and most people have sort of made the assumption he's got a Toro Rosso stop next. But if Yuki hasn't taking that seat and we by the way we both thought it was daniel's seat to lose i think he's lost it and it's yuki's at this point if you're measuring today it's a long season a lot of time left but um liam lawson or fernando alonso man this is hard the kiwi or the spaniard i mean alonso and max together alonso only likes to go to teams where he's the numero uno it feels i don't know if yeah. max and I don't know what that's going to look like, but Max is not going to be number two, regardless of who comes Dude, to join him. It was 2007, and he couldn't play well in the sandbox with Lewis. I know. And then, but Liam Lawson just looks brilliant. And if Max is going to eventually step away, then you've got your next Max maybe to cut. And is there, a, is there something to be said for the McLaren template? I know Lando's not Max, but let's put Lando and Max in that. Um, number one driver, team favorite, long-term solution, okay? I, I know Max is better than Lando yep. at this point, but I'm not saying that. But if you put them in a similar template, a young person from the Australia, New Zealand area, to put in the second seat, who's okay being in the second seat as they become proficient in F1 and is your driver of the future clearly for a long time, uh, is it Liam? I think I, I, I I'm, think voting Liam. I'm voting I'm Liam. I'm voting. I'm voting Liam. We let's do it. Let's wow. put Liam in with Max. Okay, Liam so. Lawson in with Max. Let me type that one in for you while you're getting okay. all this stuff. All right. Okay, and so with right. that, we okay. move on to the next team and next team. The next theme song. Oh, and here we go. Our fifth team to set up. As long as there's no wheel nuts involved, oh God. Sauber are the next ones up. And here we go for pulling out of the fire our drivers. Okay, and we have who? Pierre Gasly. <laughs> Alex Albon. Oh, wow. Do, 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 do. Mick Schumacher. I knew he was going to come up. I told you to put him in this just for you. <laughs> ah. Oh, well, Antonelli. Okay. Oh, this is a really hard one. So, what was it, Pierre, Alex, yes, we got, Kimi, we got, Antonelli, we got, or yeah? So we've got uh, kind of current F one uh, point scorers, Gasly and Albon. We've got yesterday's man, Mick Schumacher. So sad. 
and rising star Antonelli. So what we're going to do for the wow. Sauber team? Um, I can't remember who. I picked Hulk first for Alpine, so it's your turn to pick first. Well, I mean, this is a, a no-brainer. If this is if this were the way this actually happened in real life, you would sign Alex Albon without looking at the dollar amount you put next to his name. You'd say, please try right. for us. So, so you're putting yeah, Albon. Albon. Um, I am, am going to be that shallow and predictable. And You're putting Mick you, in? You no, know, I'm no. never going to vote against it. I've got to give him another crack. He didn't deserve to be treated like that. You don't want to put Kimi uh, Antonelli in there and let them build for I'm going to the... take a gamble. He comes back up again and gets to go in a better car. So we're at the bottom of the grid here. Uh, Sauber, Mick Schumacher's going in with uh, Alex Albono. He's going to be a good mentor for him. I mean, who wouldn't be a great driver alongside Albon, right? I just spelled his name uh, horrendously uh, wrong in the notes. So... Uh... That's okay. I think we'll remember who it was. Okay, so you got another theme song. We've got three teams left. I have three more songs. Wow. Oh, like this one. Okay. And that is the theme song for who is the second driver Mercedes to go alongside George Russell. Wow. So, two to come out of the pile. Here we go. <laughs> Will it be Yuki Sonoda? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, Yuki's a great driver. Just, could you imagine if Yuki went to Mercedes? Toto would lose his mind. Or would, oh, or will it be Fernando Alonso? He's come <gasps> back out the hat again. He's come out of the hat. That's a perfect. And he's come time. back out of the hat the second time of the other seat he could possibly be linked with. <laughs> he knows Fernando is everywhere. He's like AI. He's just creeping around in the back. By the way, could you imagine if Yuki, uh, like Toto, would be on the radio the whole time, like? <laughs> Just screaming at his own drive. Please drive the car, Yuki. We know it's bad. Um, I mean, we know the answer. I mean, Do we even have to debate? I, no, I was going to say it's got to be Fernando, right? It's Fernando. We'll move okay, on. it's Fernando. That's, that's into a that perfect Mercedes. Team. Mercedes? Mercedes? Uh, Mercedes alongside George. Right, Yuki, you go back in the bag. And we have two cars left. All right, two for teams, the next one, cars. let me find some. Here we go. Okay, Koki. Sounds like cheesy elevator music. Cheesy elevator music will be used to determine who will be driving for Haas. Okay. Hasta la vista, baby. Who Could you imagine if Magnuson's one of the ones that come back out of the hat? Because I'm actually looking. We, just we have haven't put, put anyone back for... on the same team, I don't think. No, I don't think we have yet, actually. So, uh... Oh, Antonelli comes back out of the pile. I still okay, think he should he have been picked for shot. Sauber, but that's okay. So. Well, okay, that's, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Esteban Ocon could be at us, or will it be oh, Zhou Guan Yu, or will it be final one? Oh, Pierre's back out again, Gasly. So we got the two Alpine boys, and we've got Antonelli, and we've got Zhou. Hmm. Um, my turn to go first, right? Mm, yes. Okay, so because I did him dirty by taking my favorite. Mick Schumacher. I'm going to put Antonelli and give him his crack in F1 in Great. a Ferrari. Because he's a Ferrari boy. He's going to go in the Ferrari powered Haas. There we go. It's this is logical. A, is he a Ferrari boy? I can't remember. Um, this is a great call. I'm not sure like, if he is. He's Italian. That's why I've just gone with it. I, I thought he was linked to the Mercedes seat. But anyway. He is. He is. But shh, shh, shh. Yeah, okay. Let's move fine. on. A great call, though, because Haas always look for young drivers a little cheaper on the scale. So that actually fits perfectly. And my choices were the two Alpine boys and who? Uh, Ocon, Joe, and Gasly. Oh, this is really hard. So I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you what I'm choosing between. I've, I've eliminated Esteban for reasons I can't describe. Um, and I'm choosing between Pierre, who I think very highly of and could really do something for Haas. But both Esteban and Pierre are race winners, right? And so going back to Haas, I see being a little hard for them. And Joe hasn't won a race. He's shown talent, and the cars always let him down, it feels like, the last year or two. So I'm putting Joe in there with Kimmy. Oh, I did not see that coming. I thought you were going to take some kind of elder statesman of F1 to guide yeah. Antonelli Haas, in his career. But... I mean, Haas, they purposely rolled out Mazaspin and Schumacher as rookies and like gave away the year. But then this year, so you... 
Like I, I know. Say, it's like a, it's um. They're one extreme or the other. Yeah. Uh, two rookies. Then Hulkenberg and Magnussen. And Hulkenberg, very long, okay, longer yeah, yeah. in the tooth, and now they're going going the other. Now direction. they're going back again. And with our means... final selection of car and music. And if you've been playing along. Ooh. Wait, hold on. This gets groovy. Wait, just give it one more second. Or maybe I think of the wrong one. Nope, wrong one. Okay. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Now this one, I am going to say that we do do both drivers and we Who pretend that Aston Martin and we pretend that Mr. Stroll isn't the owner anymore. And we or have that he's willing random... to not put Lance in, let's say. Yeah, okay. So and Lance is in this list. We just haven't pulled him out yet. So let's well, see. Let's see what four are... come out. Only, let's right? see what four come out. So Lance hasn't made it out of the bag yet. I feel bad for Lance. No. Well, and this one hasn't made it out of the bag yet either. And here he is on his first go around, Danny Rick. Oh boy. Mm-mm-mm. Oh, coming back for a second shot. Checo Perez. I feel like it might be his third. <laughs> it might be. Oh, definitely seen this one before as well, which is not surprising given that we put so many back in. Hey, Mag. Oh, is Lance going to get a chance? Line. Is Lance even going to get drawn out once? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yuki Sonoda. <laughs> so we've got the which RB means, guys. Which means, which means, by the way, before we even ditch these, people that will not be in F1 2025 as far as we're concerned because they're the names left back in the hat. Lance Stroll, Drugovic, Ocon, Gasly, <gasps> and Duhan. Gasly's getting done dirty. So is Ocon. So are all those drivers. Why am I trying to point them out? But I got to... So they're gone. They're gone. They do not have a drive next year as far as the dirty side is concerned. And two of these are two not going to have a driver as well. Too. So, so who's two left? Danny Rick, Danny Rick, Yuki. Danny Rick, Checo Perez, K-Mag, and Yuki. And... Uh, I'm first. Uh, yeah, because I put Kimmy in. So yeah. who are you saving? Who are you throwing a lifeline in F1 to out of these guys? Aston You've got Martin, Danny too. Rick. Like a team that uh, aspires to decent, be at the front. Yeah, that has. Team. So Danny, Rick, Yuki. I'm really struggling here. Who were the other? Hey, Mag and Perez. Oh, my God. Well, Checo. Checo's coming back to Racing Point, which is what Aston Martin was. Ooh, yes. So he's back at uh, Force India Racing Point, Aston Martin. So Checo, I think they will welcome him with open arms, even though it was when Lance or Lawrence Stroll took over where they let him go. I think the team, anyone who's been there, will say, we're, we're happy you're back, Checo. So it's up to you to figure out what the heck what? to do with the other three. I mean, so we put, got think out loud. Could you put Danny Rick at Aston Martin at this point of his career? Well, this is what I'm going. So we've got we got the enigma that is Danny Rick, yeah, who has kind of done it sometimes. Then he had his McLaren fiasco, and then he had no seat. Then he came back and did an amazing test in a Red Bull and was just like a millisecond off Max. And but then he's not proven himself in glory. So this guy is all over the map, right? Yeah. Then as almost opposite to that, we've got. Mr. Dependable, but never, ever, ever going to win a race, but might grab you a point, K-Mag. Nice guy, but... But is that what Aston Martin dependable. wants no, Yeah, I don't think so. I don't so either. then I'm left with Yuki. Do I roll the dice on? I mean, look what he did in... Uh, what he's doing to Danny in that car and grabbing points last week. Good points as well. Yeah. What, third in the power ranking? Yeah. Um, and younger than the others. A lot younger. So we're going to go alongside Checo. So Checo's going to be our number one driver out of any of these three that I pick, right? So it's going to be Checo. It's, uh, sorry, Danny. Biggest smile in F1, but but no. So you go over there with those guys that are no longer in F1. So do I gamble on Checo to go light it up and hopefully get podiums, but if in case he does a normal Checo and bins it, then K-Mag will trundle around and get points? Or do I go for Mr might go off the other end of the scale and cut his own teammate up at the end of a race and almost cause a crash <laughs> after the checkered flag Yuki. Um, oh, I love K-Mag, but he's just a bit of a bland choice for Aston Martin. And I've got a team Checo up with Yuki, haven't I? You do. It's Yuki oh. and Checo at Aston Martin. I don't think anyone saw that coming. <laughs> right. So, wow, there it is. Um, do you have any final hurrah music or do you just do eight for the eight teams? I do have a final hurrah. It's just the sound of winning and here it is. So, I to recap, in Formula One 2025 season, obviously McLaren and Ferrari are all set. We know who they have. But joining them on the grid 
We have, we'll, we'll take this one at a time, shall we, Brian? Yeah. I'll go first. Yeah. And we have Williams, we'll have Behrman and Valtteri Bottas teaming up to bring home the bacon for Williams. Toro Rosso with Carlos Sainz and Logan Sargent. Alpine with uh, Hulkenberg and Boucher. Red Bull alongside Max will be Liam Lawson. Interesting. See, that one could, that one could come true. So far, I'm, I'm saying right on a limb with everything we've done so far, but that one, that one has maybe got it. One that a team that is blatantly not going to have this lineup next year at Sauber is Alex Albon and Mick Schumacher. <laughs> Mercedes next to George will be none other than Fernando Alonso, which could actually happen. Another one that could, yeah. Uh, pretty sure this one probably won't as well, but you know, you've heard know. it here first. If it happens, at Haas will be rising star Antonelli alongside the Zhou Guan Yu. And closing the grid at Aston Martin, none other than Sergio Checo Perez. And I should get the sound effect of Buffer yelling it Sergio Checo Perez and Yuki Zenoda. Who saw that? No, which coming? what that means is the upshot of all of that from all the uh, names that went in the hat, people that will not have a seat. Next year, I'll get rid of the ones that currently don't have a seat because Duhan and Drugovic are not in F1 anyway. So let me get my pieces of paper. Not having a race next year will be Lance Stroll, Esteban Alcon, Danny Ricciardo, Pierre Gasly, and K-Mag. Oh my God, we just pulled those, uh, those five drivers. But again, let me say this. While we may not have nailed this perfectly with our drafting process, I could see those five or some subset of those five not having a drive in 25. Look at me rhyming and not even planning it. Because, like we said, silly season, contracts are up. It's the last year of the current regs before next season's regs come in. Teams may be looking for that spark, a younger driver or somebody different or maybe a cost savings um, to kind of get ready. Now, yes, they may also err on the side of familiarity and keep people they have I know that could happen as well. But this was fun. I think, Rob, if you, you're like our Twinkie Fingers, you maybe you make a little graphic with these teams. Oh, and... yeah, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i do our... Uh, yeah. And what that means, the flip side of that is those those five that we said won't have a drive, who we've introduced, which, okay, I know the Mick Schumacher was an emotional one. That one is very unlikely to happen next year. But we've said that the five drivers that will have a seat that don't uh, this year are Behrman, Poucher, Lawson, Schumacher, and Antonelli. Now... Put in my emotional Schumacher pick aside. Those are the four. Should have a. Oh, they, they could they've have got a decent chance at a seat next year, right? Which by their four, if four have got a good chance at a seat, four have to then disappear out of F1. So we'll, maybe our lineups won't be right, but I'm going to keep a list of the ones that we said won't have a drive next year and see how yeah. close we go. I mean, I could after his drive for Ferrari, I know that's a great car, but coming in with no practice, Ali Behrman showing up on the grid next year, I don't think it would surprise anybody. Liam Lawson, I think we're all pretty sure will be on the grid in 25. We've heard all the stories that he was guaranteed a seat. Yeah, exactly, this year, but he was guaranteed a seat from a variety of folks in 25, so I don't think that would be too much a surprise. Kimi Antonelli is obviously incredibly talented. Um and Teo Porsche at Alpine actually makes a lot of sense. I'm just saying, like, they love uh, keeping it inside the country. <laughs> wow. Uh, on that, that was that was that was that was fun. There we go. We might spend some time doing that. Um, yeah. But right, so um, we have to pass some time because there wasn't a race uh, next week. We won't have to do that because there is one in Suzuka, Japan, which is one of my all-time favorite tracks. I know I've said it on this pod because we've reviewed this what we're in our third year, so we'll have re reviewed Japan twice already. And I'm pretty sure both times I've already mentioned that I am that child that just the fact that it's a figure of eight, the track goes underneath itself, just instantly makes it a great race for me. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, um, it's been at Suzuka for many a year. It's kind of the Japanese GP, uh, 76 and 77 was at the Fuji Speedway, 87 through to 2006 was Suzuka. Then Fuji came along and had a couple of year reprieve. And then since 2009, it's been back at Suzuka. It is 53 laps of 3.608 miles. Um, and it is one of only two FIA grade licensed uh, circuits with a figure of eight layout. Um, the other one is Fiorana, owned by Ferrari and used for testing and development. So it's the, actually the only uh, track raced on with a figure of eight. Um, although well, is that true? Which is the one that goes under the, uh, the the one with the tunnel now these days? That doesn't go underneath itself, does it? The tunnel goes to the pit lane, goes under it. Where the hell yeah. is that? Singapore? Uh, uh, well, doesn't... Somewhere out there. Yeah, well, and Singapore's looks like a figure of eight because it actually, they meet 
but they never cross over. So like there's a wall, right. much okay. like Baku, where the wall is splitting one way to the other. This splits it. It looks like a figure of eight, but it actually isn't because one's a right turn and one's a left turn. Or they're both right turns if it's counterclockwise. Maybe. Who knows? Um, let me just say this about Suzuka. I also agree it's an amazing track. It's one of my favorite. In the February, hashtag February F1 fantasticness this year, it lost to Spa in a close race, 59.4 for Spa, and obviously then 40.6 for Suzuka. The yeah, the rest. I think I got that. 40.6 for Suzuka, which was pretty close. Um, Spa was our eventual champion, so it wasn't like they lost to a slouch. It is a great track. It's fun to drive on every video game ever made, and every driver loves it. And Seb has said many times, and as, as have others, it's their favorite track, and he has said he'd come out of retirement to run it again. 130R is one of the coolest high-speed corners you'll find. They have a bunch of slow hairpins, the snaking S-curves, the elevation changes, because you do go under the track as you come back around you see the track above which i wonder if when the drivers you... from their car i don't think they can see the lower track because will max no, be able to they... see the cars behind him <laughs> as he passes over i don't know them. But, but i was thinking about it um so i always say you know spa um brazil and suzuka away from silverstone are my kind of tracks i love and actually all of those are pretty much like combination of corner type uh, elevation changes. I just think uh, you know a lot of those kind of tracks have got those kind of similar features uh, to them. But yeah, absolutely, absolutely love uh, Suzuka. And oh, by the way, before we kind of uh, do a recap of the the 2023 race, um, what we've started up on the Discord channel is just for fun, really, is we've set a little channel up there where, as Brian just referenced, uh, great fun to play on any video game. Well, what we're doing is inviting anybody that's got any type of F1 game, come on during race week throw down your fastest lap put it in the notes say if you know if you happen to use manual or automatic transmission or if you want all the driver assist to turn on we don't care it's not a true leaderboard it's just a like like me i don't have all the equipment i don't have a steering wheel and pedals so i just threw it on there that here it is controller traction to a control turned on because i hate it when i spin out of corners consistently it's no fun and then just throw your best time down and see what other folk have got so come on the discord join the discord and and, and lay a lap time down and as rob said he doesn't have all the equipment so last year's race uh for the 23 race max started from pole set the fastest lap won the race for red bull um that was where they were able to capture their six constructors championship i think it was uh, the year prior when he won there, because it's moved around in the calendar, the year prior he won the title there. Um, was that his, weird one when they didn't know? Yeah, they, they didn't, didn't know because the was number that, yeah. of points and also was it a full race or 40% or whatever, whatever. Oscar and Lando made it in the top three in quali with Charles running out, rounding out the front row. But there were a boatload of incidents last year at Suzuka. Um, Valtteri hit Alex, bringing out a safety car at the start. Lewis and Checo had contact, forcing Checo to the pits for a new nose. I think this is the one where they ended up facing each other, or was it Valtteri and Logan? I think it was they, like the cars were facing each other. And then Perez hit K-Mag. That's the one where he spun him around, and the two of them are like nose to nose at the corner. Um, and then this was the most fascinating like yeah. inside baseball part of F1 last year where Checo hit K-Mag, the VSC came out, Checo went into the pits and they started like working on his car and we're all like, but he's retiring, right? Why are they working on it? And they just kind of kept working on the car and they sent him back out many laps later and he served his penalty and then retired. And we were all like, can you do that? <laughs> yeah, and I remember looking into it because they were saying, I remember the commentary team saying, there's no official, you don't have to submit a piece of paperwork to race control to say, we have retired the car. It's just taken as gospel that if you drive a car into the pit lane and put it up on the jacks and wheel it back in, yeah, you retired. And they'll put the little graphic up saying retired at the uh, at the bottom. But there's no, you don't need to officially retire from the race. So I've got to say it's genius from the Red Bull team. He had the penalty. If you don't serve it, it can carry across to the next race. So um, they sent him back. Was it something like nine laps? later or something crazy like that that he just came back out and yeah. trundled around did his stop go penalty and then went back round again came in retired done i and you know what it's, it is uh, fascinating absolutely. when they send cars back out like yuki if you remember in netherlands a couple years ago where he was really struggling with the was alpha tower seat that was undone yeah he was so sure he was done he starts undoing his seat belt then it's able to get it back in gear gets it back in the pits they tighten his seat belt out send him back out and on the next corner he retires i'm like what 
that, that was one of the most... That one didn't seem to have any rhyme or reason behind it, though. No, but also, they've also had some bad ones, uh, Alpha Tauri. Uh, you remember Baku? Two years in a row. The one year they sent him out with tape on his DRS wing, and they told him not to use DRS because it'd break the <laughs> tape. So they taped his rear wing together, and then one year his whole tire came off, and you remember it rolled down the like just before the back straight, whatever that is, before getting to the the tire itself was just rolling nice. down the road. So anyway, Red Bull slash Alpha Tauri with a history of putting people back out there in unique positions. Apparently, I hadn't thought of that. Um, the race was eventually won by Max, as we already said, but Lando and Oscar rounded out the podium. So it was double double podium for the McLaren boys. So they enjoyed themselves there last year um before we get on to predictions which we forgot to do for um we australia because we were so excited to have uh, paul i think and his uh, amazing wi-fi signal um <laughs> let's just look at the stats of repeat driver winners at suzuka um six for michael schumacher five for hamilton four for vettel two for berger senna hill and alonso and now after winning last year max. so last year when we did this preview max wasn't on the list as a repeat winner now he is with two and uh, repeat constructor winners, McLaren with nine, Ferrari with seven, Red Bulls won last year, jo jumped them up uh, to join Mercedes on six, Benetton and Williams have three, and Renault have two. So, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this in here because we always forget, and then we can pick it up next time, Brian. Okay, I think it's you first for the prediction. All right, then. well, so, I'm happy to uh, go first because um, you would be a doofus to pick anyone other than Max to win this race. I know we had a brake problem. Uh, I can promise you they will go over the car three times in a row before the race to make sure he doesn't have any problems this week. So I got Max. I almost went with the Grand Slam, but I, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. I, I think he could pit um, and lose the lead briefly and then regain it. So we'll see. We'll see on that. But I got Max. And then in a turn of events that I don't know if people see coming, I'm putting Charles Leclerc second and Carlos Sainz third. No Checo in, on my podium. And I'm putting Charles ahead of Carlos because I'm sure Charles is somewhere ignoring the piano, even though it's calling him to play. Because he says, I have to beat Carlos. I have to beat Carlos. And he has spent two weeks, or will have spent two weeks, getting ready for this race. So I got Max, Charles, and Carlos. I, I really, really want to go heart over head here and put a Ferrari win in this. But <laughs> oh, boy. while... While I know that signs look quick, but we only really got to see it pan out for maybe a lap before the brake issue kicked in. So I don't think it's enough to say that Ferrari have clo closed the gap enough. Max won quite comfortably here, I think, last year, like 20 seconds ahead of... Um... Japan was much later, right? So McLaren, this later. is when McLaren started getting yep. good and they were fast. So when they were their fastest last year, a Ferrari got to that level and gone beyond it to really take this to Max. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say it's a return to form, same as you, Max. But I'm going to say the curse gets broken. Um, and I'm going to put Science in at second. Oh. And I'm going to put Lando in at third. Lando? Wow, I didn't yeah. see that one coming. No, I just see... I don't know. Like, same way... I don't know. I just... Yeah. Charles just... Something isn't quite clicking uh, this year. I know he did well to get second. But again, if we beat up Checo for not taking it to Max in the same machinery and Charles is allegedly the superstar of Ferrari, then why didn't Charles chase Sainz down in Australia last week? I just... Yeah, I hate to say it because I love him and I'm obviously a Ferrari fan, but I just I think... don't feel the love for Charles this year. Oh, no, reason. he's turning it around. He just had the uh, slow button on. Slow button on, slow button on. He'll turn it off this week and he'll do fine in Japan. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Although, can I just say one more thing and then I'm done and I'll let you say whatever you like and I'll close it out. Um, the start to this calendar has been atrocious for me personally. Just let me vent for a second since, uh, you know, we're the podcasters here. And I'll just take a second. Two Saturday races in the States in the mornings have been brutal. I had a science fair from one of my daughters, and then I had a high school thing for my other daughter. I uh, missed both. So I had to watch them on delays. I was in Boston on vacation, and the race was at midnight. And I was in a hotel room, and I couldn't exactly like say, "Hey, everybody, I'm you know we're staying up till two in the morning so I can watch Dad can watch F1." And we had a big hotel room with multiple rooms; it just still wouldn't have worked. And so now we go through the the Asian section of you know the far East Asian section of this, and we'll do Japan and we'll do China with a two week break in between each, which I already referenced. 
I need some back-to-back races. I need them to happen on Sunday mornings. I need this to go back to normal. And so these are now, again, way in the middle of the night for us here in the States. And it's, it gets worse. I think one of them's 2 in the morning and one's 3 in the morning or one's midnight and 3 in the morning. It's not good. And so I cannot wait for the long Italian name, Imola Race, to come around because that all should get us back to normal a little bit. And Miami True. will be Although, afternoon. We'll have Miami before that's afternoon. I say you got Miami as an afternoon race, right? Yeah. Which is yeah, that'll be great. Which 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 for me is how it should be because obviously me uh, growing up growing in up the in the UK, yep. then for me Formula One is a Sunday afternoon thing. So adapting to a Sunday morning thing has been uh, a little bit odd. But yeah, you're right. The the US gets hit with so many more late uh, late ones because Australia would have just been a what would that have been? I think like a 6 a.m. race for me back home. So that's not too bad to get up a little bit early and watch a race. Whereas 1 a.m. is a little bit brutal. And like you say, yeah, we've got 1 a.m. for Japan, 3 a.m. for China. Yeah. You'll be, what, one hour back on each of those. But yeah, just get back to European where it can just be like 8 a.m., 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning. I'm, I'm good with that. Oh, please, please. Can't come soon enough. So, Rob, anything you want to say before we close? No, just looking forward to Suzuka. Uh, looking forward to no sleep next uh, Sunday, uh, Saturday night into Sunday, and then working out when me and you are going to get together to record the pod and talk all about what will hopefully have been an absolutely epic race where my prediction is wrong and Signs does win. <laughs> Everybody, we appreciate you joining us for the first ever Silly Season draft. It was musically focused. We had a lot of fun. We're happy you joined us. We cannot wait, as Rob said, for the Japanese Grand Prix in a week's time. And we look forward to talking about it with you uh, in one week's time. Be well, be safe. Have a great week, everyone.